to Fossil Cave People Prove Evolution. Animals have lost their sweet tooth, and we get over 2,000 comments on one show. This is just another day at the office. This is Genesis Week. And welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy made possible by the supporters of Core Ottawa Citizens for Origins Research and Education and exclusive right here on YouTube. Excellence in pirate broadcasting coming to you from Dayton Manor. We bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear. And we'll give glory to the creator while doing it. Once again, number one most talked about show in science and technology on YouTube. And number 16 most discussed video of all week on all of YouTube. You can find us at wazulu.com or genesisweek.com. Or click the ever so convenient subscribe link up top. And don't forget, you can also peruse other episodes by following the links in the upper corners of each episode. I'm your host, Ian Juby. I was inundated this past week with emails asking about the Red Deer Cave People, which were human fossils described in the Public Library of Science 1. Kurnow et al. described the fossil finds, one from 1979 in southern China, and three in 1989 found one province over from the original find. The second find was in Red Deer Cave, hence the name Red Deer Cave People. Several headlines made some pretty bold pronouncements. Red Deer Cave People may be new species of human. Red Deer Cave People, possible new human species from prehistoric China. Mysterious Chinese fossils may be new human species. The skulls in particular most certainly are unusual, but is it proof of evolutionary ascent from ape to man? No, and it would seem many evolutionists would agree. A myriad of animal bones were also found, presumably animals the Red Deer Cave people hunted, including bones from the giant Red Deer. The age of the fossils was firmly established in the minds of the researchers, based on carbon-14 dating of charcoal found in the cave, giving an age of between 14,500 and 11,000 years old. Even using evolutionary assumptions, that would mean the Red Deer Cave people were living at the same time as completely modern humans who were living elsewhere in the world, including those who had already migrated to right here in North America. Yet, the Red Deer fossils seem to have a strange mosaic of more primitive features, i.e. they have features that are more like our alleged half-ape, half-human ancestors. Now, in spite of the bold headlines, the research team really was cautious in what they claimed, being rather slow to call their find a new species. As Cournot mentioned, one of the major ongoing questions for scientists studying human evolution is the lack of a satisfactory biological definition of our own species, Homo sapiens. The National Geographic News article also noted that several other researchers were skeptical that the find was anything really unusual, as all of the features of the fossils fell within the known variations of modern humans. National Geographic quoted physical anthropologist Eric Trinkhaus as saying the report was, an unfortunate overinterpretation and misinterpretation of robust early modern humans, presumed probably with affinities to modern Melanesians. In other words, the fossils resembled those of modern peoples. In response to the question of whether or not the Red Deer people were a new species, Professor Alice Roberts responded on Twitter with, No, more likely to be late surviving archaics or just unusual modern humans. Now, I never wish to downplay the importance of fossil finds, but I do wish to keep a sober view of the interpretation of said fossils with regards to the origins debate. In this case, the Red Deer Cave people appear to be just modern humans with unusual features. An interesting report came out in PNAS about how meat-eating mammals appear to have lost their sweet taste receptors. Monell Center scientists had previously noticed that both domestic and wild cats apparently couldn't taste anything sweet. And during the course of their research, discovered that cats had lost their sweet tooth due to a genetic defect. Now, springboarding from this original research, they then asked the question, 
what about other mammals? They then compared 12 different mammals, examining their genes to discover that 7 of the 12 had lost their ability to taste anything sweet. As it turns out, the ones that had lost their ability to taste anything sweet were exclusively meat eaters. Now this is interesting on several fronts. First, you'll note that this is evolution, that is a loss of information and ability. It doesn't explain how the animals had the ability to taste anything sweet in the first place. Secondly, the genetic change occurred in different places in the different mammals, showing this had nothing to do with any alleged common ancestry of evolution. Speaking with a live science reporter, Dr. Gary Boshaw said, Different animals live in different sensory worlds, and this particularly applies to their worlds of food. Our findings provide further evidence that what animals like to eat, and this includes humans, is dependent to a significant degree on their basic taste receptor biology. But did the loss of taste affect what the animals ate? Or did what the animals ate affect their taste? Now we're already looking at what I would dare say is the opposite of evolution, the loss of receptors, not the gain. It's interesting to note that this was only with animals that had a meat-only diet. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 20, we are clearly shown that the animals were originally designed to eat plants only. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. Meat eating only came later on and was not part of the original design. So not only does this evident, evidence point to de-evolution, it also seems to be related to the fallen world, caused by man's sin with the original creation not operating the way it was originally designed. As a consequence, all of creation is affected negatively after operating outside of the design parameters. Just like you can damage your vehicle if you ignore the manufacturer's recommendations, well, we have the Manual for Life on Earth, written by the manufacturer, the Holy Bible. Woohoo! Mail for me! I was stunned to check in on last week's show to find that two days had collected 1,600 comments and shot last episode to number 16th most discussed video on all of YouTube. Cisco West did a commendable job arguing with the trolls in the comments of last week's show. Way too many posts to repeat. I wish I could quote you without losing the context of the discussion, but I can't. I commend you for being an incredible, knowledgeable resource who was surprisingly calm, cool, and respectful. I salute you. Says Cool wrote in, What's with you? Great show! Besides simply saying God did it, what, would, what could be some reasons as to why he made humans and apes have similar genetics? Well, I tried to explain this, but perhaps I didn't do so hot. It's a good and proper design. It's efficient. Once an engineer goes through the trouble of engineering and prototyping a certain part, say the transmission on a car, that same transmission can be used in other vehicles. So once the creator has gone through the trouble of designing genes, and boy they are complicated, it makes perfect sense that he would use the same genes in different organisms to accomplish the same thing. Now this comes down to homology as well, which even Stephen Gould acknowledged as, a as an argument for a common designer as much as for a common ancestor. Now the robots that I've built in the past, for example, friends and family who saw my creations elsewhere could recognize my designs because I tended to use similar or identical parts in different robot designs. Lenny Hip wrote in, quote, who directed Noah? How is it impossible? End quote. Logic says it's impossible, and the fact that there is zero evidence of a global flood and a lot of evidence that shows there couldn't have been one since humans have been here. Add to this, one, no room for the animals, two, no room for the insects, three, no room for the plants, four, no room for the food needed, five, no room for the fresh water needed, six, no way for eight people to feed and clean and keep disease from spreading, seven, 99.9% .9 of all life is now extinct. Wow, zero evidence for a worldwide flood, eh? Look, I don't mean to be disrespectful, even though you were quite disrespectful in the comments, but you clearly know nothing about what you're talking about. 
Planation surfaces, parallel layers around the world, water gaps, wind gaps, rocks like quartzites on the west coast getting transported ridiculous distances by incredibly fast moving water, persistence of facies, facies on every continent indicating all continents were underwater at once, etc, etc. Look, I spent something like the first four hours of my Complete Creation series just on the evidence for Noah's Flood, and that doesn't include a lot of my first hand research done in the past four years, like studying the massive planation service of the east coast of Canada. I followed it now for over 700 kilometers so far, demonstrating that only extremely fast moving water, quick guess, minimum of 50 miles per hour, a tsunami 1800 feet above sea level, cut the tops off of all the mountains. I presented a preliminary report, report on my blog right here. As for your alleged arguments against Noah's Ark, you really need to read through John Wimorapi's book, Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study, where he answered all these points in his typical tenacious style. Please educate yourself. There's a three hour lecture on the foundational falsehoods of creationism in the related video section just to the right, all of which dismantles creationism and teaches a fairly modern understanding of what evolution is, how it works and what we know about it, etc. I suggest everyone here watches that series compilation as it is a wealth of knowledge about the scam of creationism. Yes, and then as soon as you're finished watching that video, you can watch my video response to Aaron Ra's eighth foundational falsehood video where it took me over 30 minutes to cover all the errors he made in 10 minutes of trying to bolster the myth of evolution. Then you can watch my 11 hour complete series where I answer all of the rubbish brought up in the foundational falsehoods video, as well as presenting a compelling case against the evolution myth and affirming that the creation is the faith that fits the facts. Okay, that's enough for this week. Join me again for next Thursday for Genesis Week, and thank you for watching. Remember, you can share this show on TwitFace Plus using the convenient share button down below, and let us not forget those words of warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We'll see you next week as we continue our search for the truth. Production software was provided for Genesis Week by the Big Valley Creation Science Museum. Located just 25 minutes north of Drumheller, Alberta. Visit bbcsm.com for more details. You can help keep this program going by making a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office, Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4.